Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21 Hats podcast. I'm Lauren Feldman, your host. Every week, I sit down with three business owners to talk about the challenges they're facing. It's the kind of conversation you don't often hear in public. Our panelists address difficult topics like why their business isn't making as much money as they think it should, why their digital marketing isn't working, or why exactly they hired their brother-in-law. Owning a business can be a lonely and isolating pursuit, but at least you'll know that you're not the only one facing these issues. Got a question you'd like us to address? Send it to us and follow us on Twitter at 21 underscore hats or on our website, 21hats.com. Let's meet this week's 21 Hats podcast team. With us today are Laura Zander, CEO of Jimmy Bean's Wool, a digital version of a neighborhood yarn shop that is based in Reno, Nevada. Jay Goltz, who has several businesses in Chicago, including a picture framing shop, Artist Frame Service, and Jason Home, a home furnishing store. And William Vanderblumen, who is CEO of Vanderblumen Search Group, a recruiting firm that's based in Houston and specializes in working with churches and other faith-based organizations. So today, I'd really like to talk about culture. And I have to confess, this is a term that kind of gives me the willies, mostly because it gets thrown around a lot. And I think its meaning often gets lost. We often end up talking about trivial things that I'm not sure really reflect the true culture of a business. Also, I think we often talk about it almost uh, almost a fantasy version of uh, what it's like to work at a company when everything is going great that ignores what happens to the culture when, you know, the business struggles. Uh, so I'd like to start with a question. Uh, I, I've always been curious about this. What do you think comes first? Do you need a great culture to build a successful company or do you need a successful company to build a great culture? Uh, William, I'd like to start with you, both because you've written uh, a really good book on culture called Culture Wins, and because in that book, you acknowledge that you didn't start out with a great culture. In fact, you didn't have a very good culture at all, and, and you had to figure it out. So let me ask you first, wh which one comes first? Is it a successful business or a great culture? Well, I think some of that depends on uh, the age of the organization. Uh, you know, one organization I worked in that I didn't fit the culture was uh, a church that was uh, been around for a long time, a long, long time. And I came in assuming that I could shift or change a culture that had been around a long time. Uh, so so if you if you're going into an organization that's been around, like the culture of IBM arguably is going to be pretty tough to change, whether it's good or bad. On the flip side, if it's a startup, what I'm learning as we built our company here is uh, we didn't figure out culture for a while, but the culture in a newer organization seems to be predicated on the people themselves that are there, the, the founder and the first three or four that, that work alongside the founder. So, so in some ways, I think uh, you can say you want to have a culture all you want, but, but the culture for me is uh, how – an organization behaves while they're trying to get their vision or mission accomplished. Here in Houston, you know, we're known for innovation. We had, you know, first uh, domed sports center is the Astrodome. That's why we have AstroTurf. Uh, MD Anderson's Innovative Medicine, you know, curing cancer. Uh, President Kennedy wants to go to the moon. He says, let's go to Houston, innovation in space. Uh, when I got to Houston in 2001, I realized we had innovation in accounting. Uh, and it was called Enron <laughs> and uh, <laughs> not the best. Uh, but when I was writing the book, I don't know if it's still true. You can Google image uh, the Enron main office lobby and the images that would show up are the elevator lobby. You walk in, they have the core values uh, literally plastered to the wall. Right in front of you is the word integrity. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, <laughs> I don't know that that's exactly who they were. So you can name cultural values all you want. You said we're going to have a great culture and this is who we are. But that's kind of like me saying I'm going to win the slam dunk competition for the NBA this year. It's not going to happen. So so it's more of a who are we as people? How do we name that? And And the question I like to ask is, you know, when we're functioning at our very best, what do we as a team do? that's common to us, but uncommon to other teams around us. And then you can kind of do, rather than travel to the mountain and come down with the cultural commandments, uh, do kind of an archaeological dig 
of the team that you have and and you'll discover your culture and then you can can lean into a little bit a little bit more aspirational version but you can't just create culture that's a roundabout answer for you I hear you saying that culture is something you discover not something you mold and I think if you if you read business journalism you, you read the opposite people seem to think that culture is is what you make it Laura what does culture mean to you we just do what we do and we are who we are. And I guess people call that culture, but I don't try to create a culture intentionally. Um, I mean, I'm on the same page as William. We're like Madonna. You know, who we are today is very different from who we were five years ago, which is different from who we were 10 years ago. There are some consistent, you know, rules, if you will, you know, you must respect every human that walks in the door and recognize that we all have equal value um, and equal talents. Um, That's something that's always been the case, you know, so there are a few things kind of underlying, but, you know, as an outsider coming in, if you were to look at our and try to define our culture, you would see that it has changed over the years because we have different people that work here over the years. Hi, Laura. That's where I'll butt in and say exactly. The culture is defined by the people on your team. And and the mistake I see organizations make is when they say, we're going to go copy the cultural values of Google and we're gonna, or the slide deck for Netflix, and we're going to do that. Well, no, not unless you want to just change out all your people to match that. I think the people you have define the particular culture that you have. Now, I do think, to clarify a little bit, to me, there are two layers of culture. One is, are you a healthy place to work? Like you brought up such a good point, Laura, respect everybody who walks in the door. Well, that's not like, that's just got to be a, a, a cardinal rule. And that's just, are you healthy or not? The second piece is, all right, within that general health, what is our particular set of uh, family behaviors or family rules or or of uh, the way we always do things around here. I love what you just said about the family rules. We just had a conversation yesterday here, now that I'm in Texas, about how one of our, and I've not used this term before, but I'm going to use it from now on, but one of our family rules is you're allowed to have a bad day. You're allowed to be snotty. You're allowed to, you know, um, cut somebody off or do whatever it is because we're humans, but you have to come back and apologize and own it. And that is one of the fundamental rules. You know, if I'm shitty with somebody, then I come right back as soon as I can and say, God, I'm so sorry. I was totally inappropriate, blah, blah, blah. And then we move on. If we were MBA students, we would be teaching that that is culture as you, as you've defined it. Jay, I want to get you into this. Um, you know, what I'm hearing from William and Laura is, I think, very different from the conversation that we, we often hear, uh, on this topic. One of the, one of the lines you hear repeated all the time is, uh, culture, uh, eats strategy for lunch, uh, which, which certainly implies that it's something that you mold, not something you discover. Um, wh- where do you fall on this? First of all, I think corporate culture is a, a subset of management. It's management. It sounds much sexier and much cooler and much it, it makes. But th- at the end of the day, I believe it's a function of management. And in my little world, in my brain, I think corporate culture is three things. One, how far are you going to go for customers? I mean, are you going to do whatever it takes? Everyone says they do, but they don't. You know, So in my case, we always get the customer taken care of. Whatever we have to do, we do it. And everyone that works here knows that if we got to stay late, we got to come early, we got to drive it over somewhere, um, we do whatever, whatever we need to do. Number two is how much you expect out of employees. I don't want people working here 60, 70 hours a week. And um, that doesn't mean that I want them working 40 if they didn't get the job done. But some some organizations push people a lot more, and and I think how far you push people and do they need to be pushed and how demanding you are is absolutely part of corporate culture. And lastly is, how do you treat each other? The problem I see in it a lot of times is I think most companies would say, oh, we want a respectful environment, everyone to treat each other nice. But they keep Bob around, who really is a jackass, and everyone rolls their eyes and says, well, everyone knows how Bob is. And that is a bad excuse. And I get rid of Bob eventually. I talk to Bob. I talk to him the first time. I talk to him the second time. And I explain to Bob, you can't do that again, because if you do, it's going to be your last day, because that's not how we treat. And I've had to do that two or three times, that 
there were people working for me that were here for years that I would find people in the back crying. What's wrong? Oh, so-and-so, she makes me feel bad about myself and blah. And, and I would talk to this person and they can't stop. They just can't stop themselves. So um, my corporate culture is I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to walk the talk. I believe that there's a lot of talk about corporate culture, but there's a lot of people who aren't walking the talk. And I think it's, and I think that whole corporate culture eat strategy for lunch, what a ridiculous line. I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, what does that mean? We don't need strategy anymore, corporate culture more. How about both? William J. kind of just walked through what having a good corporate culture means to him, what he's looking, how he defines that at his business. How, how do you define it at yours? What, what are the key elements of your culture? Well, rather than elements, uh, the recovering preacher will tell a story. Um, so years ago, long before smartphones, my mother's father would take uh, his daughters and sons-in-laws to Europe once every other year or so. And he made each of them host a city. Uh, so they went to Amsterdam and, of course, dad being Vanderblumen, right? OK, you're hosting this one. Find us a place for dinner. So he calls the restaurant that he'd looked up in some book. And I uh, said, I like a table for eight in the name of Vanderblumen. And they said, sorry, we only do tables of four or fewer. OK, can I get two tables of four? Sure. OK, two tables of four, one in the name of uh, Beach and one in the name of Vanderblumen. They said, can you spell that? He said, sure. V-A-N-D-E. -E. No, 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 sir. Spell beach. <laughs> <laughs> and dad's like, these are my people. This is home. So a good company culture is when a new person walks in the door and in a very short amount of time, it's like, I belong here. This is my people. Now, so there are two layers to that. One is there's a layer of human decency. Like there's just a, a basic, is this a healthy place to work? But then beyond that is a, I fit in here. This feels like family. I don't mind spending most of my work day here because I function like they do. There are a lot of terribly competent people who are decent human beings who would never fit in at our company. Because we have quirkiness that all of us share. And, it, and the quirkiness Amen. crosses. And Amen, the quirkiness, brother. We all carry the same dysfunctions. <laughs> and, and, and whether that's we respond at a ridiculous rate or we can have a love for a wide range of different clients. We've been able to identify nine different things that identify our kind of crazy, our dysfunction, and, and then go find people that fit that so that when they walk in, they say, finally, someone that can spell Vanderblum and someone that this is my people. That, that's a long winded answer. But there you go. I love that, um, William, that the watershed moment for us a couple of years ago, I finally just let go and surrendered and was like, you know what? We are who we are and either you're going to fit or you're not. And we can't quit trying to do all these gymnastics to bend to every person that is, as you said, a good, decent human that might be smart and capable that walks in the door that doesn't fit. We are who we are. We say we only hire broken people. If you're not broken, don't come work for us because love I am it. so broken. I can't I deal it. with a bunch of perfection around me. I just I can't. <laughs> And that's so where, Jay, Jay, I totally agree with you about, you know, strategy and culture need to go together. But the mistakes I made in hiring many times early on was to say, oh, my gosh, they're so talented and they want to work here. This is awesome. Their talent is so good. Like and to, to lay it over the metaphor, their strategy for business is so good. But they didn't fit the who we are and I couldn't make it work. And I finally got to the place where there, there are some exceptions to this. But my general rule is I can't teach cultural fit, but I can teach strategic competency. So I'll take culture over competency almost every time. And that may get close to the, to the Drucker phrase that, that Lauren mentioned earlier. Which Drucker phrase? I love Drucker. He's one of the few guys Cult I love. Culture eats strategy for, yeah, that's Seriously? Him. Yes. <laughs> so disappointing. Sorry, sorry to burst your bubble, God, Jack. God, that is so, so disappointing. Okay. Uh, one more hero gone. All right. He still no. He said some brilliant stuff that is, you know, he has said you, you, you can't look for opportunity and solve problems at the same time, which, which is, I believe, which means you better find out a way to fix your problems because you can't continue moving forward without, you know, so I think he said some really smart stuff.
the people that work for me are really into what they do. I need people who are passion driven for what we do. I need people that are going to go, oh, I would love to be in display or I would love to be a buyer. I, I need people that identify something that are really into it, not someone who will take any job because she figures it'll maybe give her a better line on her resume. And we've gotten really, really good at hiring because after enough conversation, you can figure out whether these people think like we think because that's my turn. I, my average person has been here 10 and a half years. It's because of the hiring process for sure. William, I'd like to go back to something you said. You gave the example, told the story of, you know, feeling at home because someone knew how to spell Vander Um it, When you think about the fit in those terms, it, it, it seems as if it would be easy to end up in a situation where you are hiring people who, who mostly kind of look like you. How do you avoid that? How do you spot fit uh, while also uh, looking for diversity? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so we started, I started the company on a card table. We started adding people. All of a sudden we're winning culture awards when we, we named our cultural values and gone through a process, but we never really studied it. So then got asked to write a book about it. And I went and said, well, this doesn't even be about me because I, I'm just a preacher with a religion and philosophy degree. Uh, so we went and interviewed 150 CEOs of companies that were winning best places to work, top company culture, all these to, to find sort of the common threads. And one of the common threads that I heard is this two layered approach. One, we need to be a healthy place to work. But then secondly, we have to do the hard work of discovering why we all fit together. And that's where I got to this question. When we're functioning at our very best, what do we do that's common to us but uncommon to other teams around us. Once we started to get clear on that, and I heard it over and over and over from, from huge organizations to small startups that have gotten best places to work, is we figured out what we as a family do together that might be weird for others. Once that got named for us, we were able to interview around it. And, uh, you know, a great example. One of our values is ridiculous responsiveness. And, and, uh, that's, there's a long story behind that. Basically I'm a little OCD about getting back to people. And, and so that birthed a team that carries that same value where we generally get back to people within 60 seconds of them reaching out to us. And, and that's kind of crazy. I mean, there are a lot of smart people that just don't do that. And that doesn't make them, you know, abnormal. Once we had that figured out, we could start interviewing to see if someone innately behaved the same way we do. Do you have a test? Oh, yeah. I got to find a new one because I've told the story. But, uh, you know, we bring Lauren in for an interview because he wants to come work with us. And it's great. You fly all the way back to, to Newark and you take the train into Princeton and you finally get home. And then you get a text from somebody you don't recognize. And it's a text that says, hi, hi, Lauren. Uh, this is Jay. I work at Vanderbilt. I was on the road today. I heard you were in the office for an interview. Love to connect with you sometime. Well, if you don't do anything, that's that's fine. If if you if you get back to Jay within 24 hours, that's pretty awesome. This average response time for for leads is 42 hours, which is insane. Why would you not reply in two minutes and just be like, hey, hey? Two minutes is too slow. But but if Lauren <laughs> chooses to text right away and say, hey, I'm just getting home to my family, but let's set up a time to talk next week, and that's that same night. Well, now it's wow. But William, if you had just told me you wanted me to respond within 60 seconds, I would have done it. I, I didn't know. Yeah, that's right. That's like the lame interview question. Well, tell me your greatest weakness. I mean, right. like, you know, I, no, no, no. Find ways to interview when you're not supposed to be interviewing to see if people function and behave the same way you behave that's weird to the rest of the world. And and that's when you get that's that's a whole step above. Is this a healthy place to work? And oh, Harvey's just that way. It's a different way of thinking. But but my study of the 150 companies showed me people are starting to say, OK, we're all broken. Thank you, Laura. Uh, we're, but do we share the same kinds of brokenness so that when we work together, there's a synergy that's really amazing? Oh, my God, that's really smart. You should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask someone, so why are you looking for a job? And they go, well, it's just time. Really? What does that mean? I mean, no, really. And I, and I know you've been told not to say something, but there must be something about your job you don't like. And I'd like to know, because maybe I'm the same way here. It'll save both of us a lot of time. I had a woman tell me one time, it's just too corporate. Really? What does that mean? Well, you've got to use a key card to get into the bathroom. 
I figured it out myself what the problem is. She was a graphic designer in a real estate firm, the only one. And she probably had 10 bosses throwing stuff on her desk all day long going, no, no, this is more important than the other guy. And I'm sure it was frustrating. If she would have simply said, frankly, I'm the only graphic designer there. I got 10 bosses. And I would have accepted that. I would have liked her honesty and I would hire her. Instead, I don't want to hire her because I learned that if they're not honest on the interview, they're not going to be honest two months later. And I found that people that do the phony interview don't work out well here. Do any of you refer to your uh, your teams as family? Absolutely not. I'm not getting trapped into that. I think it's like a family, but I believe that's a very, very serious trap because you don't fire your family members. Yeah, but Jay, that sounds like you have a much different family background. See, in our family, you do fire members. Um, <laughs> gonna, I, I fired a couple of cousins, them. I got to say. I did yeah, too. I did you, too. You don't have to love them. You don't have to like them. You don't have to see them. Um, that's You just have a biological connection to them. Laura, do you refer to your people as a, as a family? Informally, yeah. Um, every once in a while, I mean, it's not like it's a term that we use, but I can't say that I've never said that sometimes this is like family. And in again, back to the, it's okay. Every once in a while, we're going to get in an argument. Every once in a while, we're not going to agree. But as long as we respect each other and care about each other, you know, we can work through it. So um, I also refer to it as a basketball team. Um, so I'm not, yeah. So yes. William, how about you? Yeah, I, you know, it's so interesting. I learned a new word a few years back. Uh, we do have a lot of millennials in the office, and I learned the word uh, family, uh, you know, the friends and family sort of thing. I'm just learning from them. And one thing I'm learning is this generation, which now dominates the U.S. workforce, uh, in general, they're the first generation, the first people within sub generations where you know, it's not really a cardinal goal to get married and have kids before you're in your mid-30s. And so you've got a lot of people who are waiting longer to get married, waiting longer to have kids. So what does that mean? That means you've got a lot of people whose primary relationships are found in the workplace. And that's a whole different ballgame. This generation is going to come and go from jobs and careers like crazy. And, and to me, retention is going to be the competitive advantage for companies over the next 10 to 15 years as this generation saturates the workplace. And, and retention, to me, will, will depend largely on, is this a workplace and a group of people I want to do most of my time with? So I, maybe you don't call it family, but it's different than the old school, they just work here. Uh, so so we, we call it family, and we've had to learn that that means there have to be boundaries, like it can't get too fuzzy. Uh, that can be a, there can be a whole lot of risk seeing your staff as as family, but uh, but but it's certainly more familial, including drawing a line when you have to draw a line. Do you do you ever feel that it gets in the way of that? Totally, and and I mean we could spend hours parked on this because I've learned so much the hard way. Uh, well, yes, we're all one big happy family until something gets weird, and then you know it's hard. So I, I totally hear where Jay's coming from, but but in in my experience. I've had to change my leadership to not view people who work here as just people who work here and then go home to their family. Do you have anybody working for you who, if you had it to do over again, you, you wouldn't hire them? Perhaps. Um, but let's say 99% of the people that we have right now um, for the very first time in 17 years are, are rock stars. <laughs> Nobody has 99% rock stars. No, no. No, but we're we're good. I mean, I don't think we have anybody. I have eight, nines, and tens working here. Tens are a fluke of nature. You'd be lucky if you ever get a few of them at one time. Nines got lots of them, lots of eights. The the ones that kill companies are the sixes. They're not quite bad enough for anybody to fire, but they're not good, and they're costing the company, and the other employees are covering from them. And those are the ones that we all roll our eyes and go, well, they're trying hard. Oh, uh, uh, he, he's been here a long time. Oh, everyone knows who. who those are the ones that kill companies. So I'm I'm happy to say that out of 115 people, I've got eight, nines, and tens. I might have, I not might, I have a I have a seven that's been a long time that's getting it, it, it sometimes it's not worth the it's just not worth the grief. And I finally figured out I don't need to figure it out. I just know they shouldn't work here. Well and to be fair, this is just like all forms of happiness and peace, it is temporary. William, do you have any sixes or sevens? 
I don't know that I'm as quick to grade because it's six or seven within what we've hired them to do. And I'd say, no, we don't. Uh, not at the moment. And it's always a moving thing. And the company moves and changes. Uh, and I, right now, there's nobody on my team that I wouldn't hire over. Uh, I might hire them for a different position than I have them in because I've had to move them uh, into a place where they're stronger. But uh, but right now, fortunately, we're we're in a place where I'd I'd hire them all over again. I I had an interesting conversation when I was I joined a business group because in my case I never worked anywhere, so I was just on my own trying to figure out the way the rest of the world works. So joining business groups was very eye opening. So I go to this business group. I'm probably. 32, 34, something like that. And I go there and I'm really frustrated. And I said, you know, I got this problem. I got this guy that's been with me for 10 years and he's just losing it and it's killing me and I don't know what to do. And I thought they'd all just go, Jay, grow up, do what you got to do. And you know what they all did? They all rolled their eyes and said, yeah, I got one of those. I mean, it's a problem. It's a problem. This wonderful family we want to have, like a family, we want to be nurturing, we want to be responsible. But the reality is people f- can eventually get to a point they can't do the job or maybe the job has changed. And it's not pretty. And I don't have a quick and easy answer to that. Most companies, no, not most, every company goes through that eventually. I don't know how you can avoid it. Doug Tatum wrote a book about it called No Man's Land. The the whole notion of the book is that every company reaches a point where what's worked for you so far, what got you to this point, stops working. You you've grown to a point where you you, you need better capabilities, and suddenly somebody who may have been a very loyal uh, employee for an extended period of time is in a role that they're not prepared for and can't change or don't want to change. Laura, William, have I, either of you dealt with that? Oh, absolutely. That's the worst. At least that that's been the worst for me. Because again, you know, you sit there and you wonder, what am I doing wrong? Am I the one who's not growing? Is it this person who's not growing? And especially sometimes when they try, they try really hard in this new role and it just doesn't work. It's horrible. That's when you grow up and you realize it's just not always pretty at work. And you try to be fair. You try to be nice. You give severance pay. You try to figure out, is there somewhere else in the the company you can do something? But it's just it's just not always pretty. Try doing it in a church. Well, yeah. Jesus sure. never fired anybody. Well, <laughs> they did. But they, you know, they, he, so he, so what do you do, William? Well, he, I point him to the story where he did. He fired a fig tree and it was bad. Uh, but uh, it's a whole different. <laughs> can you send me a note on that so I can use that? I <laughs> he said lo- love to. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's terrible. I you know what what I am trying to do is trying to keep a couple realities in front of our people. One, I keep our core values, our cultural values. Sometimes life shifts and cultural fit is seasonal. It's not permanent. People change. Their life circumstance changes. And and keeping the cultural values out there many times has saved our bacon on uh, having to have hard conversations, but having something for a reason, the why behind the conversation. Another thing I try to do is just say, you know, the organization changes and hopefully, you know, people who are listening today are in growing organizations. And like the hardest call I'll get is from the pastor who, you know, when we started this church together, uh, Joe was awesome. And then when we got up to 200 a week in attendance, he was good. We're headed toward 2000. And what do I he's not done anything wrong. What do I do? You know, yeah. and, and that doesn't have to be a church. It can be a business, too. But, you know, <laughs> I bought a copy of the book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Uh, I actually read it on Kindle, but I bought a hard copy just to keep in my office on my desk. And it reminds me, and I hope it's a visual reminder to everybody out there, you know, just because we all fit together now doesn't mean we'll fit together in the future. The problem out there in the marketplace is when, like I said, I never worked anywhere. I thought it was just me. And then you read these books about these great companies. There's nothing ugly in those companies. Everything's always great. And and I've read some really popular books about famous – here, I'll throw one out, Starbucks. It was a really interesting book, but apparently he's never had to fire anybody because there wasn't one episode in that entire book that talked about <laughs> that awkward moment where the guy – nothing. And then you read all these other books and you think – what am I doing wrong? And it's no, they don't tell the truth. That's what it was like having a kid. And all you read are all these <laughs> stories about how babies are so great. And it's so wonderful and magical to give birth. Yeah, no, it is not. 
I'll tell you one of the smarter things I did. I had my management staff sit around one day. This was years ago. And I said, let me ask you a question. Let's think about this. If, if we want to, how demanding do we want to be as a company? Let's say that at the number one scale is Mr. Rogers and we're just lovely to everybody and sweet and we go broke. And number 10 is at the time it was GE. Okay. I don't want to be GE where they just fire 20% of the people that we all agreed that we wanted to be a seven and a half or an eight and that we were probably a six and a half and we needed to toughen up a little bit. And a wonderful thing happened a couple of years later. I was talking about a particular employee problem, and I finally said to one of the managers, I go, you know what? I think we got to give them a little room on this, blah, blah, blah. And she turned to me and she said, and do you know why? Because we're an eight or not a 10. And it just made me feel good all over because that was ex- – she heard me. That's exactly the point. And the fact that she was able to, to articulate that from something I had told her a couple of years later, I felt great. One thing that has changed in recent years is that there's now – uh, kind of a measure of your culture that's available to the public. Uh, people can go on Glassdoor now and read comments uh, about your business. And I'm curious how seriously you take that. Do you, do you pay attention to what people are writing about you on Glassdoor? Do you, uh, do you try to manage what they're writing about you? H- how do you think about it? Uh, Laura, how about you? That's, you know what? I don't. I don't go on there. Um, one just, I do have our staff go look at it. Um, so that's, that's not fair. (laughs) You're afraid to look? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I'm too fragile. Uh, and, and a lot of times the negative comments are that are on there are things that I know. What I've noticed is, you know, the only people that put stuff up are the people that it did not end well, you know, or in, in many cases, it's the scenario that we had just talked about before where it was somebody who couldn't grow with the company. Um, and you know, it was just messy. You know, we should probably work a little harder on that, but we don't. How about you, William? We do. Uh, um, I try not to let it monopolize my energy. Um, it's kind of like, do you really pick your restaurant based on Yelp reviews? I mean, restauranteurs have figured out how to game that and make the restaurant look better than it is. Other people that are just crabby people write crabby things. Well, I guess what I'm looking for is anytime I see a real employee writing something that I really need to know, you know, uh, it, it, we see it, it even with customer satisfaction. We had a guy write in on our Facebook page yesterday. Well, they didn't get back to me as quickly as I would have liked. Well, you know, the guy, if you knew the story behind the story, it's like, oh my gosh, did, there's no point in trying to, you know, react to this because the guy was way out of bounds as a client. And same is true with uh, employees or former employees. I'm going to look for, is there something I can actually learn that's worth responding to? But but it, I do think that time will tell that unless there's some throttle for quality control with Glassdoor, it, it can be gamed. I mean, you can make it look better than it is. You can, it's all self-reported salaries. It's all self-reported reviews. And, and that doesn't have any. Nobody would advise a restaurant to get people to put it to, to completely fake, uh, positive reviews. Uh, but people, smart people do advise restaurant owners to encourage, uh, their customers to write a review. Was it an Amazon who's gotten in trouble recently for, you know, all the kind of fake reviews that are on the site and people gaming all the products and being in retail? That's kind of the area that I look at. You just you can't trust the information, at, at least from my perspective. You know, it starts to lose its value when you can't tell if it's been gamed or not been gamed. And so all of a sudden, it, at some point, it'll become useless. Maybe this is the difference between my age and the other people's age. At some point, you just say to yourself, enough already. Like, it is what it is. And yeah. I, I'm just, you know, you got, you could make yourself nuts. Someone's going to get mad at you about something. And that's just the way it is. And you better get a thicker skin because if you're naive enough to think you're going to make everybody happy. And then when you fire people, they're going to thank you for giving them an opportunity to find a different job. You're crazy. So, you, you know, you, you it, which would starts with, do you think you're going to hire perfectly? No. Are you going to have some people that you're going to have to eventually fire? Yes. Are they going to be happy with you? No. Are they going to go on Glassdoor? Quite possibly. Are they going to say nice things about you? No. It is what it is. Um, and there's only so much you can do. On that note, thank you all. I thought this was a real good conversation. Thanks for listening, everybody. This episode was produced by Jess Thubaran, founder of Blank Word Productions. Remember, if you liked what you heard, tell your friends, tell your enemies, 
subscribe, like us, and best of all, connect with us. Follow us on Twitter at 21 underscore hats and visit us at 21hats.com. Let us know what questions or issues you'd like to hear our panel of fearless business owners address. See you next time.